Okay, hello. Um, I'm going to go over the homework on optimization. This is section 4.7 on uh, optimization. And uh, this is, I think, pretty exciting because it's one of the, the most cool things that I think you can do with calculus is, is to solve these kinds of problems. This is probably one of the hardest homeworks um, of the whole um, of the whole year, maybe. Okay, uh, so let's go. Number thirteen says, uh, and this is kind of a weird place to start. This is a, a atypical uh, problem. Number thirteen says, uh, find the point on the graph of the function that is closest to the given point. And here, the the function is root x, and the point is four comma zero. Uh, okay. Well, <clears throat> let's go. Uh, what's what's sort of going on here? Mm, I have uh, my my function. So, okay, one, two, three, four. Um, by the time I get to to four, I'll be up here at at four two. So this is the the square root function that's uh, under discussion. And then there's some point here, uh, four zero. And the question is, um, what is the point uh, on uh, fx equals root x, which is closest to the point 4, 0? So um, if you had some sort of object uh, moving uh, along a square root function, and you had some observer at 4, 0, what, what's the point on this which is, which is closest? And uh, maybe your instinct is to sort of drop a perpendicular or something like that. That's the way you you find the, um, the point which is closest to a, uh, to a line, but the closest point from a, 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 of a point to a curve is not necessarily uh, that perpendicular, because that actually sort of doesn't even, even make any sense to drop a perpendicular. But roughly speaking, you know, somewhere, it's going to be somewhere like around here or something, right, that you would, that you would say uh, that would be closest. Not just directly above, not at the point 4, 2, but I think it's going to be quite close uh, to the point uh, 4, 2, I would say. Um, uh, okay, so uh, how, how do we do this problem? Now that we, we, we understand what it is that we're supposed to do, uh, we need to find this distance. Uh, well, what is this point? Uh, I can call it Mm, x maybe so let let x be the x coordinate of the point on this function and then the y coordinate would be would be root x so this is the point x comma root x and now um, what I really want to do is to find an expression for the length of this um, uh, of, of this uh, red line second here so let me call this s and what do I know about s well really just I can just apply the Pythagorean theorem uh, or or what amounts to the same thing the distance formula and I can express uh, s as a function of x. So what is s? It's the square root of, uh, and I'm just apply the distance formula between these two points. It's the, um, uh, the, the change in x, which is x minus 4 squared, plus the, the change in y, which is root x squared, um, and the square root of that. So what I've really done is now already I've done basically all the hard work, and I haven't done any calculus yet at all. Uh, the hard work is to, to, to sort of understand the problem, to figure out what it is that we're trying to optimize. In this case, we're trying to, to minimize uh, s, the length of the segment. And uh, I have expressed the length of the segment as a function of the only thing I have control over, which is um, the x-coordinate of the point on the curve. And then the y-coordinate follows. Okay, so uh, this we can, uh, we can rewrite slightly as a uh, root uh, x minus uh, 4 squared plus x. And now, okay, uh, the goal is to, to figure out where this function is minimum. So now I'm going to, to do a kind of a professional move, which is to say, look, uh, the square root of a function is, well, I'm looking at the graph of it right now, so maybe I don't need to redraw it, but um, this function is, is 1 to 1 uh, and, uh, and increasing. Uh, I guess increasing is more is more uh, the relevant point, which is to say that the square root of bigger numbers are bigger and the square root of smaller numbers are smaller. And so, if what I want to optimize is the um, the length of uh, this segment and the length of the segment is the square root, let's simplify our lives a little bit by instead of optimizing this s function, 
let's optimize some new function, I don't know what you want to call it, maybe like r or something, which is the square of this function. And to me that's, that's a little bit uh, nicer because now this is just a polynomial and I don't have to deal with that, with that disgusting square root. All I'm saying is when the inside of the square root is, is smallest is when the square root will be smallest. Um, is, is all that's really going on. And so now the goal is to, to minimize, uh, minimize uh, r. Uh, and really what we're doing is we're minimizing r with respect to x. We want to find um, for uh, x, uh, or, or for, 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 yeah, what is the x value which will make r as small as possible, because when r is small as possible, that's when the inside of the square root is as small as possible, so that's when s is as small as possible. And actually, it turns out I need no calculus for this, because you know how to, to find the minimum of a, of a, um, of a quadratic. Uh, this is actually just uh, x squared. Uh, minus uh, 8x plus 16 plus x, and so this is just 8x minus 7x plus 16. And uh, so, uh, when is, uh, when, when does uh, r, this is a parabola, and when is it minimum? Uh, so r is minimum at the vertex, and the vertex of any parabola will be at negative b over 2a, and so that's uh, negative negative 7 over 2, so that's, that's 7 halves. And therefore, the answer is that uh, the closest point is the point um, 7 halves comma root 7 halves. So uh, it's when x is 3 and a half, like I said, pretty close, pretty close to 4 comma 2, but not quite, uh, at which uh, that distance will be smallest. Now, if you didn't want to, to use properties of parabolas, but you wanted to just uh, use calculus, you can uh, you can do so, of course. Uh, it's just that when you when you get here to this point, r of x equals x squared minus seven x plus sixteen, uh, and the goal is to find out when this function is smallest. You could just differentiate, and when you differentiate, you get two x minus seven, and now you uh, put it, make a sign chart for that, uh, and this is just a line. It's a line which goes from negative to positive. So if this is r prime, uh, since the r prime is changing from negative to positive, uh, that will mean that the that r has a relative minimum, and that relative minimum uh, will be here at um, will be here at three and a half. Okay. Woo. Uh, so twenty uh, more of a traditional problem, and uh, actually also <laughs> doesn't require calculus. What does uh, twenty say? So this is a problem you could have you could have done in pre-calc A. A rancher, it's another farming problem, has 200 feet of fencing with, with which to enclose two adjacent rectangular corrals. Okay, and there is a picture uh, in the book, two adjacent rectangular corrals. Okay, so we have some, some rectangles like here. Like this is the, the structure that we want to build. Uh, what dimensions should be used so that the enclosed area will be a maximum? Uh, okay, so we want to, to find the dimensions which will produce the largest possible area. And so it's like fence, 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 and maybe you have two different kinds of cows or something like that. But, uh, so you need to keep them separate, but the goal is to make this as, as big as possible. Uh, okay, well, it's not necessarily going to be just a square now because there is this pesky uh, uh, fence line here in the middle, um, which is adding extra perimeter. So... Uh, okay, this problem is a little bit challenging because we do need to take initiative, we need to choose variables, we need to sort of uh, do a lot of uh, thinking and understanding. I'm going to call this x and this x because I don't want to do fractions, and, and, this, and this is y. Uh, okay, so x, x, y, y. Um, why is that a good choice? Eh, it's a choice. Uh, this means that I can uh, write an expression for the perimeter. The perimeter is going to be 4x plus 3y uh, equals 200. And this sort of uh, explains that uh, in the sense that, oh, okay, since the perimeter is fixed, um, you know, uh, x depends on y in, in a definite way. If you tell me what the x dimension is, then, then you've told me what the y dimension is and vice versa. Uh, now uh, I need to remember what it is that I'm trying to actually uh, optimize and what I'm trying to optimize is the area. So what is the area? Uh, I can express the area as a function of two variables uh, initially. 
Uh, well, it's just the way I've set it up. It's just going to be um, this times this, so 2xy. Um, but uh, like I was just saying, uh, I can express x in terms of y. And so, okay, I don't know what the simplest way to do this is. Perhaps we just solve for y. Uh, so what is y? It's uh, 200 uh, minus 4x over 3. There might have been a better way to do that, but this is OA. So uh, 200 uh, minus, y is 200 uh, minus 4x over 3. Uh, and since that's true, that means that I can now uh, rewrite my uh, area function as, uh, as 2x times, in place of y, I just write this, this 200 minus 4x over 3 thing. And now I've achieved what I wanted, which is I've expressed the area of the rectangular enclosure as a function of a single variable. And now the goal is to maximize this. And that's what we've been studying uh, over the, past, the previous week. Uh, from an abstract perspective, calculus can help us uh, figure out when a, when a function is maximum. Uh, okay, this is kind of uh, annoying or whatever, uh, but it is just a quadratic. So let's see, uh, I can factor out this 2 thirds x, um, but while I'm at it, maybe I will also factor out a negative 4, leaving me with x minus 50. And so really, this parabola, now more, more clearly written, is negative, third, negative 8 thirds x, x minus 50. And so, uh, what do we have here? We have a, uh, just, just a parabola, upside down, uh, 0, uh, 50, and uh, vertex 25. And um, so that mean, uh, the, the vertex is 25 because it's the average of the roots. Uh, so that means it's when x equals 25 that my area will be will be maximized. And now that I know that, then this is 25, 25, 25, and 25. Well, that means I've used 100 of my 200 uh, already. Uh, and so y must be. Um, a third of that, a third of a hundred. So this is going to be a hundred thirds and a hundred thirds. So uh, possibly counterintuitively, uh, the 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 area, the rect the rectangle which maximizes the area is not going to be a square, but it's going to be a square in which, uh, in fact, uh, twenty five is is maybe misleading because uh, really the problem asks for the dimensions of the rectangle. And so the, the, maybe it's best to, though, though, though we chose to call this x, and x is 25, maybe it's best to, to just call this 50. Uh, and if that's 50, and that's 100 thirds, uh, then what, what have we sort of learned uh, from this problem? I guess we've learned something like uh, the rectangle that maximizes the area is not going to be a square, but is going to be uh, smaller in, in this direction in the, 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 um, the y direction, and that's because in a certain way uh, this direction is more expensive. This direction requires us to, to, um, to put in uh, sort of 50% more fencing in this direction. This direction is more expensive, and so uh, that, that then the common sense uh, answer is that uh, it won't be a square, but it will be some kind of rectangle in which this dimension is shorter than, than this one. Basically that we use half of our, our fencing to, to go this way and half to go this way. Okay, uh, oh, that was a good two down, many to go. All right, those are sort of easy in the sense that maybe you could have just done those without any help, uh, and they required no calculus, uh, actually. Uh, and you did do problems like this in pre-calc A, but okay, it was a long time ago. Uh, now things suddenly get a lot harder, and I think the hard part, <laughs> I think is not the calculus. The hard part is reading, comprehension, understanding, drawing pictures, geometry, etc. So, okay, let's go. 26a. Uh, what's going on in, in, in 26a? Uh, well, uh, we are given a problem. Uh, the problem is find the area of the largest isosceles triangle that could be inscribed in a circle of radius 4. Okay. Uh, so, we have a circle. The circle has radius 4, and we have an isosceles triangle, and that isosceles triangle is going to be inscribed inside of it. 
So let's always kind of keep track of where the center of, of any uh, circle is, because it's sort of important, it's the defining property. And now what we want to do is we want to draw an isosceles triangle. And we want to draw an isosceles triangle in such a way that it's like, you know, kind of big. Um, so how's that? I guess it should meet directly over the center, if it's really isosceles. Um, something like that. All right, great. Um, not great, great, but decent. That's an isosceles triangle. Uh, question, find the area of the largest isosceles triangle that can be inscribed in a circle of radius 4. Okay, so they want to, the, the problem asks for you to find the area of this largest possible isosceles triangle, but really, I guess, uh, the problem boils down to, you know, what are the dimensions of the largest possible isosceles triangle, because then it would be easy to, to find the area of it. And here, uh, we have to, to uh, pause and kind of realize, well, okay, uh, how do I even begin to understand this problem? Well, the radius, first of all, they make a picture, which is very nice. So this problem, 26, they really kind of baby you along by uh, drawing a picture for you and, and giving you some heavy hints as to how to approach this problem. Uh, and uh, the first hint is something that maybe you shouldn't have to be told, which is, in any problem involving circles, you should draw the radii. Uh, and so I will now do that. Um, the radius is 4, so that's 4, and, and that's 4. And just already, immediately, I, I have some kind of sense of, of what's going on here. Uh, okay, that's 4 and that's 4. Um, what do I need to know to find the um, area of this triangle? Uh, which is the thing I want to maximize, well, the area of this triangle is going to be base times height. And so the, the sort of missing piece is, is this one, uh, this little thing here. Uh, because, uh, and, and uh, I'm going to call this something, and the book actually just tells you, hey, here's a big, big hint. Call this H. In other words, the book says, uh, hey, beginner on solving optimization problems, I have a tip for you. Uh, define a variable h and let h be the distance um, that the uh, the distance from the center of the circle to the base of the isosceles triangle. This was drawn in such a way that, that these two uh, are meant to be to be um, congruent. Okay, and that's maybe not uh, the most obvious choice, but it's a really good choice because uh, h was the missing uh, piece uh, uh, in order to to find the height of the triangle. And the height of the triangle is an important part of finding the, the area of the triangle. Now, if you had chosen variables differently, it still would have worked, but I think the algebra would, would turn out to be uh, quite a bit uglier. All right, why is that so good? Uh, well, because via the Pythagorean theorem, if I know that this is 4 and this is h, then I can come up with an expression for this. Uh, this is just going to be uh, root 16 minus h squared. And now I have, uh, a, now I am able, and this is why h was a better choice than than calling like the entire, you could have called the entire height of the triangle some, some, some variable, but uh, then it's a little bit uglier to, to construct this, uh, the length of this uh, segment here. Uh, and so H turns out to be a good choice to, to keep things simple. Okay, doing too much talking. What is the, well, we have to do the problem still. The, the 26A says solve by writing the area as a function of H. Okay, and that's exactly what we should be doing. What we should now be doing is trying to, to, to express the area of this triangle. Well, what's the area of any triangle? It's one half base times height. And so what's the area of this triangle? Well, the area of this triangle is going to be one half times the base, but the base of the triangle is just twice this expression that I just determined. So that's going to be two root 16 minus H squared uh, times the height, and the height of this uh, triangle is H plus four. And notice that I've written an expression for the area of this uh, triangle, but I've written an expression in terms of h. So I've constructed a function, uh, and this function takes as input uh, h, the thing I don't know, and outputs uh, root 16 minus h squared uh, h plus 4, and that represents the area of that triangle. Okay, this was the hard part, or this was one of the hard parts, although they, they kind of told you what to do, uh, that is we've, um, yeah, we've expressed the area as a function of h. And now the, the goal should just be, okay, turning to this function now, 
forgetting about the geometry for a minute, uh, just figure out when this function is as big as possible. Uh, what value of h will make this uh, a function as big as possible? And that's the value of h which will maximize the area. Okay, so to, to maximize this function, now uh, um, a pre-calculus student can't do this because to find the maximum of this function, we need to, 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 um, to use calculus. Uh, okay, so that means that we need to sort of differentiate this function somehow. Um, so let's, I uh, think, well, okay. So this is 16 minus h squared to the 1 half times h plus 4. I think I'll use the product rule. I think that's a good idea. I can't remember. Okay, so differentiating, uh, what do I get? Uh, well, I get, I'm sort of going to go across here, I think. So let me skip ahead a little bit more. Uh, board is slowing me down. So derivative of the first, uh, which is going to be, and we have to be quite careful here, derivative of something to the one half is one half something to the negative one half back inside for the derivative of 16 minus h squared, which is negative 2h. Uh, derivative of the first times the second, so h plus 4, uh, plus the first, uh, 8, 16 minus h squared to the 1 half times the derivative of the second, which is 1. All right, so that wasn't too bad. Uh, and what, what is this derivative? Um, let's see, uh, I end up with negative h, the 1 half and the 2 cancel, times uh, h plus 4 times 16 minus h squared to the negative 1 half, um, and then plus 16 minus h squared to the 1 half. Uh, and now, the skill that we practiced last, uh, last week uh, and the week before, uh, let's factor out 16 minus h squared to the negative one-half out of, out of this whole thing. Uh, and leaving me with, oh man, negative h, h plus 4, Oh, well, the 16 minus h squared to the negative one half just comes right out. Uh, and then plus, uh, and then here, uh, since I've factored out something to the negative one half, and this is something to the one half, then that's going to just be 16 minus h squared to the one, because by exponent rules, something to the negative one half times something to the one is something to the one half. Okay, this is the, the so-called uh, great trick from the, the previous week, uh, because it means that it's sort of uh, in, in one step, I go from this very disgusting expression with fractional exponents and mixtures of, of, of negative and positive exponents to something where all the ugly is kind of up here on the front and now left behind is just a simple polynomial. So what is this? It's negative h squared um, minus 4h uh, minus 4h uh, plus 16 uh, minus h squared. And what's all this? Well, this is 16 minus h squared to the, so a lot of algebra now, to the negative one half times, and we are left behind with negative 2h squared minus 4h plus 16. Okay, that's kind of annoying. Let's take out a negative 2, leaving us with h squared uh, plus 2h minus 8. I think I did that right, mm-hmm. So that's really negative two times, that factors conveniently as h plus six, uh, no, not six, uh, four and two, of course. Uh, and so that's plus four uh, h minus two. Yeah, uh, h, mm-hmm, that is just right. And then here we have 16 minus h squared to the negative one half. Okay, so uh, this was some calculus, including careful use of the product rule, the chain rule, then a lot of algebra, and what I have determined is that, and I'm gonna write it over here now, uh, that what I've determined is that the most um, clear uh, expression of the derivative is negative two h plus 4, uh, row too big, um, maybe I don't have enough room here, I'll just write smaller, negative 2, h plus 4, h minus 2, time, uh, over, uh, 
uh, the square root of 16 minus h squared. And I think all the effort was in carefully, carefully uh, manipulating uh, and performing sort of a gentle algebra on this derivative to, to, to get it to the point where it's in a form that I can easily look at it and analyze it. And that was the message of last week, is that uh, we really want to know when our derivatives are positive and negative so that we can know when our functions increasing and decreasing, we, we can find relative extrema. <gasps> well, what now? Uh, well, now we just perform a side analysis on this derivative. And what do we see? Uh, well, the, the bottom is just a square root function that's going to be always positive. And so to, to make a sign chart for, for a prime, uh, we can just look at the, the sign of the numerator. And the numerator is going to be a quadratic, which changes sign at negative 4, uh, 2. And because the leading coefficient is negative 2, it's going to be a minus plus minus. And I always label carefully um, my sign chart with a prime. Uh, and what's going on? Uh, this derivative is negative, then positive, then negative. What am I looking for again? I'm trying to find a, a, a maximum. And so that's going to be here. So relative max at uh, h equals 2. And uh, actually, we can, we can sort of um, put some, some bounds on this h. How big could h be sort of at most? Well, if h keeps growing and growing and growing, the biggest it could possibly be is 4. And I, I suppose it just like can't even be 4. So maybe I'll, I'll put like an open circle there. Otherwise, you, you don't get like an actual triangle. And the next question is, um, if I start thinking about this problem a little bit, uh, notice how I made my sign chart from, from sort of negative infinity to infinity first. And that was uh, a good tip because, uh, well, I just want to know when this derivative is positive and negative, and that's the simplest way to make the sign chart. But you might question whether these, these negative values of h are meaningful. And my answer to that is perhaps negative h is meaningful. Because notice that we've, we've made an assumption when we drew this picture uh, and the assumption that we made is that um, the base of the isosceles triangle is going to be uh, below the center. That seems very reasonable because it would seem kind of dumb. Well, it's not impossible to have an isosceles triangle whose base is, um, is above the center. But I don't think that this is a candidate for, for the largest isosceles triangle. Still, though, if we define uh, h in a more careful way, we can interpret negative h as meaning the distance the, the, the base of the isosceles triangle is from the, um, from the center when the base is above the center. So I do think that negative uh, h values are, um, are possible, but uh, <laughs> continuing to talk about this problem, uh, I don't think it's possible for h to be anything more than negative 4. And so I, I actually am going to draw sort of a sort of a line here, maybe a squiggly line, to indicate that truly to the left of negative four, uh, h values are, are really meaningless because uh, h uh, can only be a certain amount. Uh, the base can only be a certain amount above the, the center. So I think that uh, h h should properly go from negative four to four is the best is the best interval. Um, nonetheless, I still. Uh, don't think I did anything wrong here. I, I still support uh, this this work because making the entire sign chart helps us determine helps us determine what's going on. Okay, so what is going on? Answer: There's a relative max at h equals two, and if starting at h equals negative four, uh, h a prime is positive and then negative. What that means is that a the function representing the area is increasing all the way from negative four to two, and then decreasing all the way from two to four. And therefore, uh, by the first derivative test, not only is there a relative max at h equals 2, but that will be the absolute max. And therefore, the conclusion of this problem, almost, is that uh, the area is max when uh, h equals 2. And in some ways, we could just stop uh, there. Uh, but uh, let's try to, to, to understand this. I'm just going to sit on the floor now and, and redraw this picture. Uh, what does it mean if h is 2? Well, if h is 
2, here's the center, it means that that's 4, and that's 2, and so the largest isosceles triangle is the one uh, which is, whose base is halfway sort of down uh, from the, the, the center. And this is, is, is in fact my, my triangle. So if that's 2 now, and that's 4, we can, uh, we can calculate this exactly. This is going to be um, a 2 root 3. And, yeah, and if that's the case, then uh, suddenly I recognize this kind of triangle. And, and okay, big surprise, this is an isos we, we determined, that we, we started the problem by saying that that's an isosceles triangle, but actually, let's see, what's the best way to put this? Why do I know this is 2 root 3? Because the Pythagorean theorem. But once I know that's 2 root 3, then I also recognize this as being root 3 times that. And so this is actually uh, 60, uh, and, um, well, that's also 60, and those two have to be equal. So what, what do I know? That this is, I now know that this is just an equilateral triangle. Why do I know that? Um, oh boy. Uh, because uh, the, the, these two triangles are, are congruent to each other, uh, certainly, by SSS, and that's uh, 120, and that's 120, uh, and so these are each 30, and that, and since this is 30, that makes um, this angle and this angle uh, 60, uh, and so, and so that, that one is 2. And so indeed, the sort of takeaway from this entire problem is, hey, if you want to, to, to build an isosceles triangle, specifically uh, inside of a, a circle, the best possible triangle to build is, is the equilateral triangle. Okay, Woo. these problems are all hard and take forever. Let's just keep on going. Uh, all right, twenty seven says, okay, I think this one's uh, maybe, maybe a little bit easier, hopefully. Uh, it says, okay, so it's 27, here we go. A rectangle is bounded by the x-axis and the semicircle um, y equals 25 root, uh, y equals root 25 minus x squared. Uh, oh, what length and width should the rectangle have so that its area uh, is a maximum? Okay, so this one's a little bit less, well, it's just phrased uh, as a geometry problem, but ultimately uh, we have, okay, sure we have a semicircle, but really it's a, it's a circle of radius 5, uh, and so here is the origin, here is, if we're going to do it this way, here's the, the, the coordinate system, this is the curve, y equals root 25 uh, minus x squared, it's just the, the top half of a semicircle radius 5 centered at the origin, so this is 5 comma 0, and the question is, uh, a rectangle is bounded, oh, this a little bit harder because no picture was given, 